All right, cool. So I'm going to talk about platform engineering today um, with the, uh, well, I didn't have a title. I got asked to talk about platform engineering and I, I kind of, you know, I, I couldn't find a good title, so it just became this. Um, oh. All right, so this is me, um, in case you didn't know. Uh, like uh, like mentioned, I'm, I'm a Microsoft MVP for the stuff that I do in Azure, but m more specifically towards my uh, work with uh, AKS and Kubernetes and Cloud Native in, in, um, in Azure. And I, I do a lot in the CNCF. Uh, I am currently in the Tag App Delivery um, group where I um, uh, am one of the chairs of the Platforms Working Group, uh, which is the reason why I do a lot of talking about platform engineering in general. Um, I also do a lot of other things. I don't want to bore you, so feel free to go to my LinkedIn if you want to know what I actually do. Um, but yeah, I can see the text is a little small. There will be QR codes later on to scan and and we'll see. So I have disclaimer, and uh, that is the what I always say. That it, I always say it depends, right? A anything that I say uh, doesn't necessarily have to be the universal truth. Um, I, I'm often wrong. Uh, and it all depends on what you as an organization do and what you need. Um, so uh, just so you know, what I'm, what I'm saying, what I'm going to talk about here is, is going to be very much the it depends uh, scenario. I'm going to try to be as broad as possible on these things. But at the same time, it's, you know, um, feel free to come approach me afterwards and talk about your specific use cases uh, if, uh, if that is something you want to do. Or just yell out. I don't have a set agenda anyway. So, so there's a lot of things we need to take care of when we build, you know, systems. Um, there's the uh, there's infrastructure, there's end users, there's application. There's more than this. This is just random stuff I threw up there. Uh, but um, we you know, there's a lot of things that go into creating a system that uh, that uh, people use and. Uh, Lately, or you know, the past couple of years, there's been this kind of idea that there's a full stack developer, not only on the developer side, but also on basically everything else. Uh, I found this image. Uh, yeah, and it's a full stack developer is now not only supposed to take care of the front end things and the back end things, and also kind of the data layer, but you're also supposed to do security automation. You're supposed to build it. You're supposed to check all the pipelines. You're basically supposed to do everything, um, which, um, as we know, that there's a lot of things to do for one person. Um, it, no matter how much you are uh, capable, you know, it's the, uh, the cog what we call the uh, cognitive overload is, uh, is very present there. Like taking all those tasks uh, really doesn't work. Um, and I usually reference like abstraction layers and. Um, so, we, so we have all these things that we need to take care of. Some of these abstraction layers are something you don't need to think about. Uh, if you are in the public cloud, there's most likely some physical infrastructure, but you don't really care about that because that just happens, right? We, we moved away from doing servers, uh, you know, moving servers and, and, uh, and um, pulling cables and all those kind of things. Uh, um, and then we have the public cloud, obviously. Um, for, for many of us, it's probably Azure. Um, but you know there are a number of others as well, and then you have the application services that are supposed to run on that, and then you have the end users. And what used to be the case uh, for people like me is that we kind of ended up in, in in this area, right? Uh, we, you know, if you were on the platform team, you were supposed to take care of Azure. Um, the problem is uh, the people who are you know working with applications and services, they need to create stuff and they need to use different services, need platform you know pass solutions, uh, so on and so forth. They need the integration into stuff, uh, taking care of uh, whatever they need in the public cloud kind of <coughs> doesn't make sense at some point. you you know what I ended up saying is like the public cloud is it, that's my platform that not, that's not necessarily the developer's platform so you know, moving on, we started getting this like platform service layer where uh, people like me and probably others in this room started creating something, uh, a new abstraction layer for the developers, something that makes sense for them, for the organization, and takes care of uh, things like security and automation and all those kind of things out of the box. Um, you know, a, a, a safe place to run your code. Um, and the reason why we started moving towards this is again because it, it, it get it's get it's getting really complicated, 
right? Usually, you know, back in the days, you had a server. If you needed a mail server, you installed it on a physical server, and you put it into rack, and you put some cables in, and it's like, all right, there you go. That's your server. Um, now, you know, even mail service is not one server. It's thousands of servers connected, and they need to do all this, like, advanced stuff. Um, we are so you know, dependent on technology and the things, we, like, everything we do run in a cloud somewhere built by someone. Um, and there's, there's, new, uh, there's new paradigms, there's new things happening everywhere. And just getting that all to kind of align if you are supposed to take over everything just doesn't work. So we started abstracting some of the more um, the public cloud stuff and, and started you know, creating you know, a place for, for code to run uh, and make it easier. I'm going to come back to that concept. But first, I need to mention, and I, I always do, so if you've seen me before, you're probably tired of hearing about Conway's law, but uh, Melvin Conway was really smart. Uh, in in 60, 67, he, he had a, a, a paper uh, called How Do Committees Invent? I, I, I'm, I'm not advertising going, you know, that you should go and read it. You, you can. It's really hard to read now because it was created in 67. So the, the language there is kind of weird. But... In that paper, this particular line um, came to be what we now call Conway's Law, which is that any organization that designs a system defined broadly will produce a design whose structure is a copy of the organization's communica communication structure. That turns out to be, to this day, still true. If you, like we did before, have a very um, uh, domain-specific team structure, we ended up having basically uh, a, a database uh, a system that was created for the database admin and not for the people who are using it. Uh, the infrastructure people uh, uh, could never do anything wrong. So if you didn't get through a firewall, that was not their fault. It's obviously you're, you're the problem here. You, know, you get all that kind of uh, stuff. Um, so uh, you know, this is how we used to have it. Um, and when moving to the cloud, um, we tried, or some of us at least tried to move away from this, the typical like sysadmin, DBA, and everything like that. There should be a security here as well, but it's not, because no one cares about security, apparently. Uh, and, and then you have the developer who kind of just want to get stuff done. I was almost you know, saying I swear, shouldn't do that on stage. Um, and what you get there is like the friction. You, you can't get anything done. Um, the uh, people are afraid, they don't understand anything outside of their box. So they, it kind of becomes one of those things where you, uh, you as a developer want to get a certain feature in, but the infrastructure people then say, well, how will this affect our systems down the line? And it's like, we, we don't really care. We just you know, want to get up and running. Um, so w we had, not to say a solution, but we started, uh, everyone started talking about this DevOps thing at, uh, at some point. And, um, it was kind of what we started, uh, you know, discovered that we needed to do when moving out to the cloud. Everything became more complex. We need to automate things. We need to uh, have uh, uh, defined stuff as code, even if you are an operations person. Uh, and all these kind of tools, like, for instance, like Terraform and starting using pipelines to, you know, define the systems and so on and so forth, started popping up. And... Uh, DevOps did a lot of things for us in that sense, but at the same time, um, people kind of misunderstood the idea of DevOps. You know, DevOps is a, a collaboration culture. It is a, a set of practices that span across Dev and Ops. But as soon as this came out, uh, people saw, all right, cool, that's the new operations people. So they created DevOps engineers and had a DevOps team. And then all everyone doing development just kind of went to the DevOps team to get access to stuff, and so on and so forth. And that's kind of not the point. Um, so, sorry, I, I read you know did all my slides right before leaving office. I don't I don't can't even remember what it is. Uh, so you know we we had that uh, going on, and obviously that's not what it is. Um, DevOps, um, this is from, um, you can barely see it, but there's a, the, there was a DevOps topologies uh, website that came out, uh, written, um, originally from a blog post by a certain person 
who then later took it on, we'll, we'll get to that, um, started talking about what DevOps actually is. And we, uh, he, he created this DevOps topologies and started talking about the anti-types. So we have, for instance, Dev and Ops silos, obviously kind of what we did before. Uh, doesn't really work. I don't understand how anyone would think that it would work, but uh, you know, uh, people st still to this day keep on doing this. So you know, th that's kind of weird. Uh, and then you have uh, another anti-type, the DevOps team silo, where you kind of create the DevOps team, and now everything's solved. So you know, these people are supposed to bind all of these things together, but what you get is basically just ops doing what they did, and there's a new team of people trying to get stuff done. Uh, and you know it, it doesn't work. Well, a pattern that actually works is obviously DevOps, which is where you have Dev and Ops and they collaborate. Um, uh, these concepts are a bit old now, you know, old in and, uh, IT world. And uh, like the, like the, it mentions there in the text, um, promised land of DevOps, smooth collaboration, and so on and so forth. And if you are a certain type of uh, company or organization, this actually does work. If you have uh, Dev and Ops and they uh, started uh, having the same type of, uh, for instance, uh, Ops uh, defining infrastructure as code, so they're using Git, which the developers also are, and you kind of get the same type of standards and you can actually collaborate between uh, when it comes to practices and so on and so forth. Uh, use the same platform to store your code as the developers do, so you you know you can combine your forces and and make that smooth. Uh, this works if you have an organization where um, uh, where you have a you know strong like I said, there's strong technical leadership. You have something very defined. For instance, if you're creating a certain service, you have some operational people and some developer people, and they all work towards the same goal. This works. Um, there's also the uh, full shared responsibility. Same type of thing. What they mention here, which you can't really see because it's a small text, is uh, uh, stuff like Netflix. This is kind of it. Like Netflix do one thing. They, they don't do one thing. Uh, but for any, anyone from the outside, they do one thing. They deliver Netflix. So uh, there, there's no hard line between dev and ops. They are kind of doing the same thing. They just have slightly different responsibilities and they work with the same tools all together. So they're very entwined. And then you have uh, what kind of now kind of became platform engineering, where you have uh, what they called ops as infrastructure as a service platform. Um, and <coughs> it's more aligned towards this, and it kind of moved away from this as well. Uh, but originally, this is what they kind of imagined. You would have uh, some sort of like a virtual team that could go to all the different developer teams and kind of figure out what what they actually need and what you know uh, helps them as a team to get their stuff done. While you have the operational uh, people who created the platform where uh, these uh, dev people now are kind of you know customers of uh, of uh, operations. And this is fine and well, but at some point we kind of. Um, when, sorry, at some point we kind of went towards what we now called platform engineering. And um, again, going to skip over that. Uh, Matthew Skelton was the one that created the DevOps topologies originally, which then got added to by Manuel Pace, however you're supposed to pronounce his name, and they created the book Team Topologies. So if you haven't read the book Team Topologies, I recommend anyone to read it. And I still find it weird if I ask people, have you read this book? And they still say no. This has defined what I do and what people who do platform engineering uh, it's so much that it's, it's worth taking a look at. And uh, oh, shameless plug, we have the DevOps Days Oslo 2023 where uh, Matthew Skelton is going to be and speak about uh, team topologies or specifically how, how to fail at team topologies. So how not to actually take the lessons from the book and what to do. So. Uh, if you have the time, I highly recommend uh, you know going to those days also and, and see Matthew for yourself, and he prob he can explain this much better than I can. So, over to platform engineering. Um, again, sorry, I need to check. All right, yes. So, platform engineering is a a concept. It's a domain knowledge. It is. Basically, what uh, you would say IT operations should be, right? 
as soon as uh, things get uh, more advanced, uh, we, we, us that are doing the operational part need to get up to speed and, and make sure that uh, w these advanced services that people are creating have a safe space to be. We don't want to be uh, stopping them from innovating. We want to make sure that they can get their job done quickly and efficiently. And in general, just uh, make it a good experience for them. So platform engineering, um, one of the key elements of platform engineering is the customer focus, the, the, you know, creating something as a product focus. M you know, my platform is a product and the developers are customers. If they can't get uh, their code running on the platform and they have issues, that's, it's not them being an idiot. It's you who haven't created a service that is easily understandable. So you need to make sure that they are actually able to run their stuff on this platform. Um, and platform engineering is not DevOps 2.0. Um, there's also the entire DevOps is dead thing, which I've many times spoken about, which is stupid. Um, because again, this is just the actual implementation from the ops side of what DevOps is. This is taking that collaboration culture and making sure that we who do operations are up to speed with what people on the developer side are doing. Um, so in the CNCF, in the Platforms Working Group, we uh, have uh, created a white paper, uh, the so-called Platforms White Paper, you know, generic name. Uh, the thing is we made the Platforms Working Group uh, to uh, create content about platform and platform engineering, but uh, and everyone we asked had a different definition of what a platform is. So we start off by defining what a platform is. So this is a picture from the Platforms White Paper. Um, and again, this is broad terms, and I would suggest that you read the white paper. It's really good. I didn't write a word of it, so that's why it's good, probably. Uh, <laughs> uh, I just signed off when, uh, yeah, that's, that, this is good. So, uh, how, to, how to get all the fame without, yeah. Anyway, so uh, uh, many people were involved in this and created uh, what we now have uh, and we refer to as kind of the defini definition of a platform. And um, on top here, we have the product and applications teams. The, these are the people who make the thing that make money, right? Um, and uh, the entrance to the platform is then obviously the platform interface. And the platform interface can be a lot of things. It could be a, um, just documentation. It could be a, you know, some sort of template code, um, you know, be a Terraform module. It might be you know, whatever. <laughs> Um, it could be what I prefer to at least get up to is a full-fledged API so people can call that API and say, I need a new environment. Um, preferably, then again, with a CLI tool so it's easy so I don't have to send curl commands or anything like that. Or even get to the point where there's a web portal where they go in and say, I want a environment of so and so and so. Um, we try to map some of these um, elements to, um, to actual tools in the CNCF and uh, a little bit around. It's kind of hard to see here, but you know, we got stuff like uh, Backstage uh, as on the web portal and um, uh, like Dapper for the APIs and, and so on and so forth. For, you know, and Helm for uh, project environment templates. Just to name a few, there's obviously too many to list. <clears throat> and then there's the set of platform capabilities. What is this platform supposed to do? You know, um, is it supposed to provide environments and resources? Uh, is that of type infrastructure or databases or messaging, et cetera, et cetera? And then there's these uh, um, uh, things that make everything work. <laughs> you know, you need to uh, be able to identify as a person that's supposed to be doing something, to, to, you know, are supposed to be able to, to uh, get these uh, environments and resources. You need to have <coughs> secret management. You need to, you know, have scanning of uh, of artifacts so people don't put stuff in with vulnerabilities and then everything blows up. Uh, and you need to observe it and make sure that everything is running okay. You know, so uh, all of these things together is kind of, you know, this is basically a platform. And you might have some aspects of this in place, and and you might uh, prioritize uh, certain aspects before getting to others. But in general. This is like a very um, broad overview of what a platform is. And then at the end, the outcome is obviously capabilities and service providers. So if you, for instance, have a platform that, uh, that hosts databases of a certain type for your developers, so they can just get a new 
you know, database environment, you know, they need to be able to access that in a proper manner and get it up and running and should be stable and, and good. Um, like I said, you don't necessarily need to have every single aspect in. Uh, so there's a, um, a concept from uh, team topologies called thinnest viable platform. Uh, so instead of like a, um, a um, um, some, uh, uh, the idea is to take what are the least amount of capabilities that you need to serve your users and start from there. So for again, if you have uh, a certain way of running uh, applications, but you need to dynamically create databases, then your platform basically just needs to create databases in a way that makes sense for them. That, that could potentially be your like, thinnest viable platform. And again, the case, you know, uh, it, it all depends on, on what you're trying to do. Uh, so we, uh, it's also mentioned in the platforms white paper. Um, one of the things we uh, often talk about is like, what are the capabilities that you know that you need that you can prioritize now? Because the rest usually is just uh, implementation details. Uh, but you need to be able to focus somewhere and start with something that are you know as thin as possible, and then you can expand on it as as you go along. And there's a lot of things to choose between. Uh, this is just the graduated and incubating projects in the CNCF, and then there's also the sandbox uh, uh, projects in the CNCF, and then there's everything that's open source and used that is not in the CNCF. And at some point, you kind of get this, like, you know, you get a bunch of stuff. Um, and, it's, uh, and it's hard to, to know where to start even at some point. Um, there, what I would suggest, however, and it's not only because uh, I'm in the CNCF, but I, if you're doing platform engineering, I would suggest at least try to keep to CNCF projects. And the reason for that is uh, to become a CNCF project, you have to go through a lot of things. You have to uh, have a project that is not just run by a company. Uh, you need, obviously, to donate the code away. Um, you need to, to graduate or go through the graduation process. You need to show that people are, uh, there's a lot of maintainers from different companies that people are working uh, towards a common goal. Um, and a good example of something that's not in the CNCF that did kind of stir up things recently is the Terraform or HashiCorp changing of license thing. S stuff like that wouldn't happen if it was a CNCF project because they, you couldn't. You don't have the right to do that. Uh, you could fork it and create your own thing, but uh, CNCF will kind of be in the uh, in the lead on that. Um, so the reason why I mention is if if there's a project that is on this side, if if it's a graduated project, they have gone through a lot. They've gone through reporting. They've gone through uh, uh, all these things to make sure that they are uh, you know can get to the point of being a graduated project. And one of the first one obviously was Kubernetes. Um, and for the longest time, Kubernetes and a couple of others here, like etcd, that you know, kind of is important when you're doing Kubernetes, um, and, and Core DNS again. Kind of weird that they all kind of went together uh, on this journey. Um, they were for the longest time the only ones, but now we see, for instance, um, uh, Argo and Flux. You know, uh, you know, uh, GitOps basically is now mature enough to have projects that are through all this logging, uh, storage, uh, Linkerd and Istio for service mesh. You know, we, we have a lot of things here now that, uh, that consist of truly like graduate and mature projects. Um, so again, there's a lot of things to choose between. So what kind of, where should you start? And it is, I, I guess, fun for a lot of people to kind of, you know, bash on Kubernetes because it's so complicated. Uh, I don't think it's complicated. Uh, um, um, I don't know if I'm one of the few people who think that, but it's basically the same thing we've done always, but in a better slick package, right? Uh, but my opinion, again, <coughs> is that if you're doing platform engineering, if you're not doing it on Kubernetes, then you must have a very good reason not to. Uh, a lot of the things you get out of a platform like Kubernetes is, uh, can be really hard to replicate with different services and different uh, um, uh, components. Uh, but if you're going with the Kubernetes route, uh, first of all, what you have to think about is how do people interact with the platform? 
Um, um, you also have to think about things like how many are you know several clusters. What is what does an environment mean, and so on and so forth. But interaction against, against platform is the thing that developers usually you know where they get involved. Um, I prefer GitOps. Uh, I'm also an open GitOps maintainer. I've been part of defining what GitOps is, so I'm kind of biased. But you know, I I really prefer GitOps for various reasons. There's also like portals like Backstage that you can have, or you could start creating APIs or abstracting APIs with different tools, depending. Um, and then you have to kind of focus on the security aspects of this because you know uh, none of the things that are in the cloud are secure by default. Um, if you go into uh, you know Azure and say I want a Kubernetes cluster, it's not going to be secure because you can't do public cloud by having everything secure. You have to go the other way. You have to be able to fit everyone, and then you have to narrow it down. Uh, so security is something that you should uh, be considerate of. Uh, for instance, only allow containers from known sources um, so people don't you know, have a scenario where stuff gets pulled from somewhere that can get tampered with. Um, you know, scan for vulnerabilities in the cluster. Make sure that the code that's running there is actually secure. And least privilege still applies. Like I said, it's still the same concept. So you know, uh, least privilege is something people talked about, you know, 20 plus years ago. Still applies. So don't have a container with root user on it. Don't give them access to the underlying nodes. You know, they should be able to start and run the application they're supposed to run, and that's it. Nothing else. And also, when you have um, developers on, uh, if developers have to interact with a cluster, that's kind of like SSHing into a server. Uh, we don't do that, except we do. Um, you, people shouldn't be interacting directly with the cluster. They should go through a different means. Uh, for instance, if it's GitOps, they don't really need to interact with a cluster in itself because they will drop their stuff up in a Git repository and the process do its thing. And then you may need to make sure that they have the dashboards and every, the tools they need to make sure that it actually works. So they don't have to go into a cluster. But then, you know, stuff happens and then you have to go into a cluster anyway. So uh, at least try to keep it uh, secure. Uh, if you're going for the Azure Kubernetes service, which I kind of recommend, uh, again, um, kind of biased, uh, make sure the policy add-on is on. What happens then is that the OPA gatekeeper uh, uh, controller gets installed, and the Azure policies that you define in, in Azure comes down as uh, OPA uh, policies written in re Rego. Uh, you could then add your own policies if that doesn't fit you. They have expanded that policy set a lot. Uh, but at, at least at that point, you would have s something that you can define policies for that stops people from doing bad stuff. Um, if you have a thing running in Kubernetes, it probably needs to talk to a different thing, pretty sure. Uh, I, I'm not saying don't run databases in Kubernetes. There's always a reason to do that if that is what you need to do. But if you don't, you need to talk to a database somewhere else. And to do that, you need to be able to uh, authenticate to that database. And uh, the better way of doing that right now, at least, is what's called a workload identity. So. Uh, at that point, you can get a managed identity by Azure uh, that you can make available to a pod. So the pod will basically just get this credential from the, you know, uh, from the Azure, Azure uh, platform itself. Instead of you creating uh, this thing and you know, chaperoning a, a set of credentials back and forth and someone misplaces them and stuff happens. So it, th at that point, it's all on the platform side. Uh, and it has its ups and downs, and there's some scenarios where it doesn't work still, but it's, it's getting there. Um, on the network side, uh, if you press plus one Kubernetes cluster in, in Azure, you will get something called a KubeNet, which is perfectly fine if you need to have a cluster where you're going to run something and you don't really care about anything else. If you are going to run that traffic through a firewall or you're going to, you know, um, uh, whitelisted into some different service, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, is going to get really hard. So th uh, there's the Azure uh, uh, CNI, which is how Kubernetes do networking, where basically every pod will get their um, get their IP address as if they were a service or a VM in, in Azure. Um, and there's some improvements coming there. There's something called the, the overlay uh, networking, which kind of does what KubeNet is supposed to do, but in an actual way that works. 
uh, and so on and so forth. But, but so far, it's been basically a standard of use Azure CNI. Uh, there's also the Cilium uh, CNI, which is great, uh, which kind of takes this to a new level, uh, and that might cost money or not. Uh, speaking of Cilium, um, network policy is an important part. Uh, there's different options. Um, all of them at the base level do what they're supposed to do, which is make sure that the networking inside of your Kubernetes cluster you know, is secure. You could say um, pods running in a certain namespace is not um, allowed to talk to a pod in a different namespace and so on and so forth. So that's how we can kind of do uh, network segregation inside of your Kubernetes cluster. Um, at least a soft uh, level. If you have stuff that is extremely important to not have any crosstalk at all, put up a new cluster. Because in Kubernetes, it's still on the same platform. They're still using the same um, uh, ways of communicating. You're not going to be totally free from potential bleed outs and if people exploit things. So if you have something that's need to be totally separate on a network level, don't put it in the same cluster. All right, so containers is obviously the next thing to think about when you're doing stuff in, uh, in Kubernetes. Keep it dry uh, or don't repeat yourself. Um, everyone needs to build containers. If you're putting something in a container, you need to build it. Um, there's no reason why everyone has to figure out how to get these containers to work, right? It is the same process, and if it's done correctly, uh, it's, uh, it could be a, a process that works well on basically all scenarios to just kind of change out what types of images are in use. Um, and test your code often. Uh, test your code when you're developing it to make sure it's secure, but then when you put it into a container image, make sure that you test that container image and make sure that that is also secure because there's no reason to have secure code in an unsecure container. And, you know, continue to take care. This is basically where your code's supposed to live. This is the, this is the uh, um, um, you know, transport method of, of your application. You, you write your code, it runs, cool, and then you're gonna have, you want to, it to run on Kubernetes or on something else. Uh, containers is how they get there. You know, uh, it's not a process where you just like you slap up a, a, an example Docker file and kind of go like, all right, that's cool. It builds. There's always something to do. Make sure that your containers are um, uh, well developed. And you know, this really quick one for security: OpenSF, uh, the Open uh, uh, Source Security Foundation, OpenSF, do a lot of things when it comes to container security. There's the um, uh, best practices for open source developer uh, working group. Uh, they created, uh, if you heard people talk about S booms and all those kind of things, that come from OpenSSF. Um, uh, if you're doing stuff and you need your code to be secure, uh, you should look at what they're doing and, and try to integrate as much as possible. There's a lot of things there, but that's the highlight of it. I don't know where we're at the time. Now we can talk a little bit more. So GetOps, again, uh, kind of biased, but uh, from a um, platform engineering uh, um, perspective, GetOps just kind of simplifies the application delivery. So instead of having these uh, pipelines that do all the processes and, and, and do a lot of, um, um, you know, trying to massage your thing into your cluster in some aspects, uh, GetOps is designed just to uh, do the, the uh, or uh, sorry, not the delivery, actually the deployment, I should say, do the deployment uh, just smooth. It should just work. Um, and GetOps um, is, you know, if you base yourself on the GetOps principles, uh, it should run from the environment side. Uh, so it's easy to secure because it's, it's, it's right where uh, everything needs to be. You don't have to pull secrets in from outside. You don't have to interact with other systems. Uh, it should be able to look at your Git repository, and then it will pull in those changes, and everything else that it needs should be local to the cluster. So it's easy to secure. Uh, relatively <laughs> easy to do rollbacks, because if you put something out there, again, uh, one of the key aspects of GitOps is that uh, it's immutable and versioned. 
So if you put out a version that fails, you should be able to roll back to the previous version, which is a version that actually works. So if you put out something and it fails, you should be able to roll it back pretty easily. Yes, this is a hard thing to pronounce yet. Interoperability, uh, and I should say, in progress with progressive delivery. So uh, I'm sure people here have heard the term. If you haven't, progressive delivery is, is kind of what it sounds like. Uh, you have a, instead of just uh, you know putting something out there, there's a, a path to go along. So for instance, like a blue-green deployment scenario where you have two different deployments at the same time, or a canary where you kind of you test it, test test the waters, uh, put something out. Uh, if you're using um, uh, Flux for for GitOps, uh, there's a tool that is in the same project called Flagger, uh, where if you do a new deployment, uh, Flagger will update traffic in, put up a new container with a new code, update the traffic by 10% if you define it to that. So 10% of your users will come into the new deployment. If it doesn't get any errors, it continues to increase that. And if everything's smooth, then it turns, it, you know, it's 100% over to the new one and it deletes the previous one. Um, so you, instead of having those scenarios where you put up a new thing, get a new IP address, and you sit with DNS and kind of shift over, and then everything goes to hell, and you go, oh, crap, and you have to shift back and figure out what happens. There's systems here that make it work. Yeah, so summary, uh, attempt two. The world runs on software. Um, there's nothing you're doing right now that's not <laughs> running through some piece of software. And um, the, uh, like the, uh, the, the, the what's it called, the technosocial aspect of the world now is we're, we're so intertwined with the, the apps and services that we're using that uh, we can't really be expected to keep up with all these technical changes, like every, like uh, we can't have a one-man team or a one-person team, sorry, uh, doing everything for a company, for instance, like Netflix. Like that wouldn't work. There's too many aspects. There's too many technical aspects. There's too many uh, things that needs to be discussed and figured out. Um, so th the world is complicated now when it comes to technology, um, and the further we evolve, the harder it gets. There's new things that people invent. Uh, that might just be a rehash of something old, which it usually is. But sometimes it's uh, we started getting stuff like AI, which we are all tired of hearing about, uh, and those kind of things. Now we have to think about technology in a different way, and how does that implement into our process, and so on and so forth. Um, and it just gets really hard. Um, and you know, one of the things that I feel is that we should have a mandatory adoption of, of DevOps, the, the DevOps principles, not the DevOps engineer role. Um, we need to be able to uh, collaborate between the different, uh, uh, the different um, teams and different uh, uh, roles that are, you know, uh, that we need to combine to make everything work. And Platform engineering is a natural evolution of IT operations. We, this is what, uh, you know, this is the end result of, you know, when I started working, we did, I did a lot of PowerShell scripts to automate stuff. And at that point, there were still people going like, well, why would you need to do that? I can just click on the thing in my portal thing and give someone a new, you know, ticket ops. Ticket ops is really bad. Uh, it's slow. Um, and we needed to step up our game, and DevOps kind of brought it into light, and now we kind of see the end result of that. Uh, platform engineering is a product-centric approach. We're supposed to create something that's easy to use, that people can use, that's secure to use, without stopping them from using it the way that they want to use it. We need to be able to listen to the de developers um, when they ask for something, and not just say, no, I'm not going to do that. You still kind of have to do that sometimes, but but in most cases, if they, there's probably a reason why they're asking for for a thing. And platform engineering is all about reducing cognitive load. A lot of people said that DevOps was a failure because uh, pe uh, people ended up, up having way too much stuff to do because that meant that everyone had to do everything because that was the, that was you know, again this misunderstanding about what DevOps actually is kind of grew up to. to place where you got something like 
DevOps is dead, going around everywhere, and so on and so forth. DevOps is not dead. Platform engineering doesn't replace DevOps, but platform engineering is the op IT operations side of uh, the DevOps uh, thing. So if you want to learn more or contribute, there's the CNCF, uh, obviously, there's do a lot of things there. There's, um, as you have tag security, again, this is, I, I did a, a lot of these at Secrets uh, Festival, uh, however you're supposed to say it in English. So there's some uh, remnants there. But tag app delivery, that's where I'm at for the things that I do. There's also networking, et cetera. So there's a lot of things if you are interested. Um, but specifically for platform engineering, there's a platform working group where uh, we do a lot of things. We have the platforms uh, white paper. We're now creating a platforms maturity model. So you have something to kind of see like where are we at on certain aspects. Uh, there's also the um, uh, uh, platform as a product white paper that people are uh, pitching, uh, gonna start creating. So we're gonna create a lot of content around platform engineering that uh, hopefully will be useful for people. And also OpenSSF do a lot of things and also the Linux Foundation as a whole has a lot of things. Speaking of which, uh, we at Amesto42, we joined all this. Um, uh, again, because th it's one of the ways that we can contribute by uh, giving away some money. <laughs> uh, so people that uh, you know, have the possibility to kind of continue to, to create these things that, uh, that we all, because again, without the things that the Linux Foundation, the CNCF and so on, it, without the things that they support, what are we gonna do? You know, if that goes away tomorrow, uh, airplanes are going to fall out of the sky, like literally. Um, so, questions, suggestions, topics of discussion, hit me with anything and I'll try to answer. I have social medias, because that's cool to have. I, I refuse to not call it Twitter. It's still Twitter until, yeah, until further notice. <laughs> I'll let you know. Um, yeah, any questions? So uh, how do you think it will? Sorry. So how do you think it will reduce the cognitive load of the IT operations team? Um, it's all about uh, setting it into a system that works not only um, if you're creating a service that only works for IT ops, that's not going to work for dev and vice versa. So you need to find uh, ways to uh, automate things uh, in a matter that. Uh, it makes it easy both for the, the developers and the operation people to uh, um, get stuff done. Um, for instance, um, uh, you know, you don't want anyone sitting there doing manual scanning of container registries. Want to automate that? That's also useful for the rest of the team. Uh, uh, for instance, again, GitOps. GitOps takes away a lot of pain for the DevOps engineer. Uh, because, again, you don't have to make a pipeline that magically or, or tries to squish, squish everything in together into a manifest and make something that works in Kubernetes because you could just point it at a place and say, put manifests in there and it works. You know? So it's all about selecting the right tools and kind of figuring out what makes sense not only for you know, the developers but also for operational. Anything else? What about the on-premises and air-gapped environments? On-premises and air-gapped environments, we don't speak about those things. <laughs> <laughs> they doesn't exist. No, uh, there's a lot of uh, there's a lot of tools uh, that uh, you know work on-premises. You, uh, there's a lot of people who created uh, platforms for Kubernetes, for instance. Rancher do a lot of tools for Kubernetes. You can take a lot of these concepts and put them on premises. You might just have a slightly different way of interacting, and you might have to, uh, you know, again, if 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 uh, Microsoft isn't doing the abstraction layer to create services around databases and so on and so forth, then you kind of need that. You have to do that, and you might find a tool that does that, or you might have to build it yourself. Uh, all depending on the scenario, but. Uh, there's a lot of people who have on-premises and air stuff, and they should also do stuff in a cloud-native fashion. Yeah. Um, okay. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah um, <coughs> currently, we, uh, we are using uh, 
Azure and Kubernetes, uh, Argo, Helm charts, try yep. to set up a good flow. Uh, in what context do you think GitOps would be a useful addition or replacement to some of these technologies? Well, Argo in itself can do GitOps. Uh, and um, if, if you go back uh, to what GitOps is, GitOps is uh, a set of principles among them is uh, they should be able to reconcile and automatically uh, um, apply changes from the desired state, which is what's in Git. You know, the version that is in Git is the desired state, and it should be able to reconcile and make sure the system is in the desired state. Argo in itself is actually a very powerful GitOps tool, but it can be set up in a non-GitOps fashion. Unlike Flux, which is a pure GitOps tool, you can't really do that. You, you can, but at that point, you're kind of just breaking the flow, uh, so to speak. You have to really get in there and destroy everything. Uh, but but uh, so Argo can uh, be set up, uh, or is most, mostly used in a GitOps fashion. Um, and again, it kind of comes back to the uh, you need to make sure that, um, uh, that the, the flow works for you. So if you have a, a developer, a staging, a testing environment, you know, you have those kind of uh, primitives, um, you might need to uh, kind of move that process of approving changes from the tool that deploys the stuff and into Git. So at that point, kind of uh, operating something in pod would be approved uh, on the Git side of things. Uh, shift, again, shift left, like you kind of want to do with everything. So um, uh, if the testing in Git works, the, uh, the integration part of that works, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, as soon as it hits the Git repository for real, then that changes will be carried out in the, in the production environment. Does that make sense? Um, in our industry these days, there is uh, there are people that are very uh, negative towards the whole Kubernetes movement and adding uh, you know, a notion that it's a mistake for companies to move to Kubernetes and those kind of things. And when you pitch platform engineering in your companies, I've, I've, I've seen uh, that that adds to that uh, conversation more. It adds more fire to that topic that Platform engineering is just glorified IT operations to mm. some degree. And uh, so where I'm trying to go in with this question is more, what is the missing link? And what do you think is from, um, how should one approach uh, your managers, your executives and things like that to uh, basically see that, yeah, um, what we should do to kind of maybe convince as well, or not convince, mm. but show a different perspective of how things evolve in, in our industry? Um, that's really hard in <laughs> itself, uh, just uh, simply because um, um, I, I see there's a lot of places, usually the people who are in charge aren't technical people, and you know, you kind of have to give them the elevator pitch on something that's deeply technical. That, that kind of becomes hard at some point to do without, you know, uh, again, making them more confused. Um, I, I usually tend to bring up this with like abstraction layers again. Um, uh, you create a, uh, what you want to do with something like Kubernetes, you want to um, not necessarily introduce a tool for the people who are going to use the platform, but you're introducing a tool for you as a platform engineer to build with. Kubernetes is a, a, it's a platform tool to build platforms. Um, what you want to do with that is make it easier for people to utilize that platform by abstracting away all the technical things. So for them it's going to be easier. Um, and again, kind of comes back to the, the main issue where there's a lot of technical leaders who aren't technical. The leaders who happen to now be leaders of something that's supposed to be technical. Um, I think we need to work on that and stuff, the, the things that we are putting out in the platforms working group I think are helping kind of demystifying a lot of these things. 
Um, again, in, in my perspective, Kubernetes is not hard. It, it's, it's pretty straightforward. You have stuff, uh, you have the same concepts as you used to have before, but it's in one defined package. Package, And, and you just need to be able to um, get them away from thinking that you, uh, you're trying to uh, get Kubernetes in uh, for uh, the, end, the end uses of the platform to use, but you're getting it in for you to create something that will make it easy for them. Um, again, not really an easy thing to do, unfortunately. Um, but, it, but if there is anything uh, I can help with, you know, feel free to reach out. Uh, I can pitch stuff. <laughs> Uh, one follow-up you mentioned. You mentioned um, uh, product-centric. I, uh, I, I, the way I understand it, it's in the context of application development. But uh, I, we also we try actually to build a platform for developer platform in a product-centric manner, mm -hmm. thus treating the platform as a product. Yes. And have you seen this as an um, examples where this could succeed in enterprises? Yeah, so, uh, for instance, instead of saying that um, um, uh, an environment for a developer or some, or, you know, is a set of uh, these services is, uh, you know, and then if you're using Azure terminology, you would have to start pulling in like sizing, SKUs, and all those kind of things, and so on and so forth. If you then instead could say we have defined a medium, small, and large environments for dev and for prod, and those are, you know, again, the products that you get out of this platform. Uh, that helps a lot uh, for, uh, again, if you're talking directly towards, uh, against uh, developers, they just need to know that they need a developer environment or a staging environment or a production environment, uh, and kind of everything else should fit in there, so they don't have to think about that. Uh, again, that's kind of what platform engineering tries to do, is trying to make sure that your customers, which is the developer or potentially IT ops itself, uh, have a product uh, to aim for and not necessarily technical implementation details, which again, like I said, is an abstraction layer. Um, if that helps selling it into your into boss, I don't know. There's a lot of things that need to, to align for, for that to, to happen. but. At least try. I think I have two questions or statements or points. Um, maybe I can try to be the devil's advocate. I mean, yeah, I we live in a world of abstractions and abstractions and abstractions. And yeah. when I go to my boss and say, hey, we should build a Kubernetes as a platform, uh, the first question is, if it's a product, what is the value that we're getting? What is the difference for, I mean, we have, say, five teams. Um, this is hypothetical. Yeah. We have, say, five teams. They can just launch a, um, Azure Web App, five, 10, 15 Azure Web Apps, and that's enough. That's it. We don't need a platform on top of that. Even simple, we can have a server in our like, office and connect it to the DNS, and that's good enough. Mm. Like, so there is. When we talk of a platform as a product, that product needs to have some value. Yeah. And sometimes Kubernetes isn't a, a product that actually gives us any value. On the other hand, if the only thing that we do is make databases, maybe it's worth it to sort of go to, say, um, client scale and say, we're only getting databases from you. That's all we need. You are a platform already as a service. We don't need anything else. This mm. is just does everything. Um, so it's. That was not a question, but yeah. more of a clarification that it is about getting value, and you could get value from other things than just Kubernetes as a platform. You could get it from other places. Well. And, and, and if you're not getting uh, in your organization value from uh, adopting platform engineering, then you probably shouldn't. Where the it depends comes in. Uh, if your team is you know, consistent of five people, uh, and uh, you know, some focus a little bit on certain aspects, and, and some you know, you, you probably don't need to add a new layer of abstraction on top of, for instance, Azure. Most likely, the problem is um, when you start, uh, when you have 
you know, a lot, a lot of developers, or a lot of people who are supposed to build something that's supposed to be safe, uh, to be able to communicate between, uh, to to uh, have that in, uh, interoperability and everything like that. If you then start uh, just, like, what a lot of people have usually done is just hire in someone to be kind of like the, the platform team people, and they just start, you know. Um, creating valid solutions and, and you know, having uh, tickets pushed back and forth and so on. So you're not going to get to a place where the, you're going to uh, get value out of it either. So it's, it, again, it kind of depends. Like, you could not uh, implement something like platform engineering or Kubernetes specifically, and that could work fine. But um, in many cases, people say, like we don't need Kubernetes because it's a new abstraction thing. And then they end up literally creating Kubernetes uh, aspects. They create the service functions that update certificates. They uh, rotate secrets by running something, something. They have three to 500 app services with microservices, et cetera, et cetera, which will get a lot harder to deal with if something goes wrong, if there's a security breach, if there's et cetera, et cetera than having them in on a platform build on Kubernetes, which has all the things that you need to, to deal with something like that out of the box. But, but yes, it, it, it does depend, um, like I said in the start. Yes, I think it's uh, pretty much the same observation uh, which came from him. Like, uh, we have the platform team. Um, uh, we like have a platform uh, defined with uh, Azure App Service, like pretty basic, and it's like meeting the need. Um, and I think like uh, you show some characteristics, like what the platform engineering should have, like containers and Kubernetes and uh, GitOps probably. But I think shouldn't it be a better approach to think more about like uh, the bottlenecks the developers are facing, like if. If the approach is product centric, then we should have <coughs> surveys or we should have like uh, uh, kind of sittings with the developers where they can kind of comment on how's the current platform with the current stack uh, rather than thinking about if it should be Kubernetes or like GitOps or uh, yeah. uh, focus more on like uh, uh, it's more like a uh, comment, not a question, but like mm. uh, focus more on what is the current bottlenecks and challenges uh, and then from that the technology can be a solution like okay and GitOps to solve that particular solution rather than having specific kind of characteristics of platform building. Yes, yes. so uh, that's, that's the entire point, point of why we first had the platform's white paper um, where we define capabilities. Uh, there, there are there some specific components not to this just because it's in the CNCF landscape and it's relevant to kind of give context but there, there's nowhere here that specifically say a product or component or service the entire idea is to uh, again start thinking about what kind of capabilities do you need if uh, in your organization uh, having uh, again certain templated solutions and for instance like documentation for that works and makes uh, uh, makes uh, you know works in your organization. That, that's fine. That doesn't mean that you're not uh, you know uh, doing good work. Like it, it's not. Uh, and when the platform maturity model comes out, a lot of those aspects will be in there. Uh, and there's different aspects of maturity that we go into. Among other things, uh, um, well. We're not necessarily landing on specific, but one of the aspects is uh, interaction or uh, interface, or depending on what we're going to end up calling it. And at the end of the line, the most mature is what we kind of would see as Azure. Azure, if, if you create it, needed to create Azure, Azure is really mature. It has a portal. You can go in, you just click, everything's done behind the scenes. You don't have to think about it. You just get something pre uh, present, uh, represented in a way that makes it easy for you to interact with the millions of physical machines that are running stuff on it, right? Um, but along the way there, we have stuff like templating and, and golden paths and all those kind of things. 
And if that works in your company, you don't have to kind of like level up to, to, to the top level. You could stop there and say, well, this is fine for us. Because if you're going to go further, you would have to invest time and energy into getting further. And if that doesn't give you any value, then you probably shouldn't. Could you maybe talk a bit about where does the, uh, the boundary of responsibility between the platform team and the different teams? Because often mm. there is a lot more more to it than just uh, pushing out containers with, uh, with images. There yep. are a lot of other things. Uh, at, at some point, we start talking about you build it, you run it, and all those kind of things, which at that point, it was kind of silly because again that kind of led up to the not even full stack developer but the full stack everything right you're supposed to create the application both both back and front end of it do the database stuff you need to do all the et cetera et cetera et cetera um, if you adopt a you know platform engineering as an approach uh, the idea here is that you would enable teams to have that autonomy and that responsibilities because you will give them the tools to make sure that everything is you know as intended uh, you would give them dashboard for monitoring you would automatically set up alerting for certain security stuff so they will kind of get that information out of the box um, again um, trying to take away cognitive load not only for the developers who before needed to create all these things uh, which they didn't which is why we have a lot of insecure environments, uh, and take away the cognitive load of the platform team who kind of had to do that on the behalf of everyone. If, if that is part of the platform, it's easier for everyone. The people who uh, build it should be able to run it, and they should have all the tools to do that. Um, and um, um, when it comes to responsibility specifically, I would say it is, uh, it, there are some clear responsibility areas you know if you build a platform the platform engineering team probably should be responsible for the platform itself uh, but they shouldn't necessarily be responsible <coughs> for the databases that people are you know setting up and pushing stuff into um, not necessarily responsible for the specifics in the code that develop but there should be um, tools in place to make sure that the people who are developers will get kind of that information and, and get the guidance that they need. So you have you have some guardrails there. Um, because if you don't have guardrails that you can't have, you, you build it, you run it. Because at that point, it would be too much to take on for anyone. And it's hard to get that kind of level of insight on what it takes on all levels. Any more questions for Robert? Yeah, no? <laughs> uh, I think we can just get a cross-section of work from you.